Thank you very much, uh, President Sam Allen, for this kind introduction. The subject of my presentation is geosynthetics, the discipline beyond the products. Hello from Paris, Paris where the IGS was found on 10 November 1983, here in this building. In 1980, in the United States, the group of professionals involved in geotextiles asked me to chair the organizing committee of an international conference on geotextiles. I agreed and I said it will be called the second international conference on geotextiles. By saying that, I implied that the International Conference on the Use of Fabrics in Geotechnics that had taken place in Paris in 1977 would be retroactively recognized as the first international conference on geotextiles. My vision was <clears throat> that by establishing continuity between the first international conference at the Second International Conference, it was implied that a third international conference had to be organized. And my vision was that this continuity would lead to the formation of an international society on geotextiles. I convinced the members of the organizing committee and the minutes of the 23rd 1980 meeting stated the official name will be the Second International Conference on Geotextile. This name implies that the conference held in Paris in 77 is recognized as the first one and that the third conference could be organized in 86 or 87. Also implied is that an international society on geotextiles should be created. And this was the first time an international society on geotextiles was mentioned in writing. It was essential to generate worldwide interest. In January 82, I contacted European colleagues and I suggested a meeting to discuss the creation of an international society on geotextiles. At the meeting in Zurich, Switzerland, in March 82, we had 25 participants from seven European countries. At the meeting, I presented the concept of an international society on geotextiles, and after discussion, all agreed that such society should be formed. Three months later, in June 82, I presented the concept of an International Society on Geotextiles to North American colleagues at a similar meeting in Toronto, Canada. Finally, in August 82, in conjunction with the Second International Conference on Geotextiles, I presented again the concept of an International Society on Geotextiles. The meeting was attended by 150 participants from 34 countries. According to the minute prepared by the secretary of the meeting, I asked for a vote and the majority of 150 participants voted for the formation of such a society. And there were a few abstaining votes and no opposition. So the fact that 34 countries were represented in the decision to form the society indicates that there was worldwide enthusiasm. An interim committee was formed to prepare the creation of the society. The first task was to write bylaws. The main contributor of the bylaws was Guy Massonneau. Two key decisions were made. First, Guy Massonneau recommended that the bylaws ensure an important role for corporate members. This was an excellent recommendation. Indeed, an active participation of manufacturers in the society is essential to encourage 
cooperation between those who make the geosynthetics and those who use the geosynthetics. The second decision was to adopt a rule of what individual member won vote. This seems obvious today, but it was not at that time. Indeed, some of us wanted one country, one vote, which was the format adopted by some other international societies. But I was afraid that one country, one vote would encourage lobbying. The next step was the, to select the location of the third international conference on geotextile. This was an essential step because a third international conference on geotextiles would definitely establish continuity in the geotextile community. Today, the location of international conferences are selected by GIGS Council. In 1982-83, we were an informal committee. Vienna, Austria was selected. Finally, DRGS was formally created in Paris on 10 November 1983. But shortly after a first challenge. In June 1984, as I chaired the first and last international conference on geomembranes, I convinced, um, I convened a meeting to discuss the following choice the formation of an international society on geomembranes or the inclusion of geomembranes in the IGS. I strongly recommended the second option, which was adopted. As a result, the bylaws of the IGS were amended to include geotextiles, geomembranes, and related products. However, we kept the acronym IGS. This was very wise because other geotechnical societies were tempted by the catchy acronym IGS. But repeating geotextiles, geomembranes, and related products in IGS documents and names of conferences was very tedious. Finally, the IGS Council voted to change the name of the society to International Geosynthetics Society. By an extraordinary coincidence, this vote took place on 10 November 1992, the ninth anniversary of the founding of the IGS. In 1993, the celebration of the 10th anniversary of the IGS with a big cake was more casual than the celebration today of the 40th anniversary. Today, today the IGS has more than 3,000 individual members, 177 corporate members, and 45 chapters. More than 3,000 papers have been published in our two official journals, and regional conferences are organized in all continents. And 12 international conferences on geosynthetics have been held so far in different parts of the world. And we look forward to the 13th International Conference on Geosynthetics to be held in Montreal, Canada in 2026. The fact that the IGS is 40 years old is an indication of success. The IGS is successful because it fulfills a need and because it is well managed. But also, the IGS is successful because the geosynthetics are successful. Therefore, it is important to understand why geosynthetics are successful. And now I invite you to think and analyze. Today, it is almost impossible 
to practice geotechnical engineering without using geosynthetics. And it is fair to say that geosynthetics have been the most important innovation in geotechnical engineering in the second half of the 20th century. One may argue that geosynthetics are not unique because there have been many innovations in geotechnical engineering. However, unlike other innovations, the geosynthetics have pervaded most branches of engineering, but of geotechnical engineering, but why? Geosynthetics have pervaded most branches of geotechnical engineering because there is a wide variety of geosynthetics. The variety of geosynthetics is illustrated on this uh, slide. And even more uh, geosynthetics. The variety of geosynthetics translates into a number of geo words. The wide variety of geosynthetics makes it possible for them to perform a wide variety of functions. Therefore, geosynthetics can be used in a wide variety of geotechnical applications. But one may argue that this doesn't seem to be an original reason because there is also a wide variety of soils. Indeed, there is a wide variety of soils from clay to rockfield. This phrase, from clay to rockfield, implies that soils can be classified by the size of their particles. Of course, a complete soil classification involves more criteria than particle size. However, it is true that particle size is the most important criterion in soil classification. And the phrase from clay to rockfield does include all types of soils. There is no such phrase for geosynthetics. It doesn't make sense to say there is a variety of geosynthetics from a certain type to another type. For example, if we say there is a variety of geosynthetics from geotextiles to geomembranes, this doesn't mean anything. <laughs> this is because the variety of geosynthetics cannot be described by a single criterion. Indeed, several criteria are needed to describe the variety of geosynthetics. Dimension, one-dimensional, two-dimensional, three-dimensional geosynthetic. Structure, open geosynthetics, closed geosynthetics, intermediate. Direction, one-directional, two-directional, three- or multi-directional, quasi-isotropic. Since several criteria are needed to describe the wide variety of geosynthetics, whereas one criterion is sufficient to describe the variety of soils, it is possible to say that the variety of geosynthetics is of a higher order than the variety of soils. As a result, of this higher order of variety, the properties of geosynthetics cover a wider range than the properties of soils. For example, reinforcement geosynthetics, unlike soils, are able to carry tensile stresses. Geotextile interlayers can be used to decrease or to increase shear strengths between soil layers. Geotextiles can be used as separators because they are more continuous than soil layers. Geonet drains may be more permeable than gravel. Geomembrane barriers are more watertight than clay. Geotextile filters at the same time may be more permeable than sand filters and retain 
smaller particles. This example shows that geotextiles are able to perform defined functions. And the identification of basic functions of geotextiles as early as 1973 has led to development of geosynthetics designed to perform specific functions. As a result, there is some correlation between the types of geosynthetics and their functions, and the variety of geosynthetics is related to the variety of functions. The consequence of the variety of geosynthetics is that extensive manufacturing capabilities are required to ensure the production of many types of high-quality geosynthetics. The manufacturers of geosynthetics should be congratulated for this achievement, which stems from technolo technological developments and also from an understanding of the needs as a result of cooperation with users. And in fact, cooperation between members is the hallmark of our discipline and the IGS is the best forum for cooperation. The consistency and reliability of high quality geosynthetics, which is remarkable results from quality control by manufacturers and certification of geosynthetics in some countries. Testing laboratories have played a key role by contributing to the reliability of geosynthetics and the certification of many laboratories is important to the credibility of our industry. In summary, the wide range of geosynthetics properties and the availability of high quality geosynthetics with a high degree of consistency and reliability are practical reasons which explain that geosynthetics have pervaded all branches of geotechnical engineering. In addition to these practical reasons, which are essential, there are fundamental reasons which explain the success of geosynthetics. Therefore, I invite you to more thinking. The first fundamental reason for the success of geosynthetics is that there is a need for continuous materials in geotechnical engineering. Geotechnical structures are built with swords, which are materials composed of particles. In other words, soils are discrete materials. The continuity of discrete materials can be disrupted by tensile stresses associated with erosion, slip surfaces, earthquakes, traffic, differential displacement, etc. Clearly, when they are not kept together by compressive stresses, discrete material may lose their continuity. Continuity, which is the opposite of rupture, is essential for performance. The performance of discrete materials is improved if they are associated with continuous materials such as a geosynthetics, provided that the presence of a continuous material is not creating a discontinuity which would cause a slip surface. So clearly, uh, geosynthetics are not magic carpets and their use requires appropriate design. Having shown that the first fundamental reason of the success of geosynthetics is the need for continuous materials in geotechnical structures, we will see that the second fundamental reason for the success of geosynthetics is the need for two-dimensional materials in geotechnical structures. 
geotechnical engineering structures are essentially three-dimensional because volume and mass are needed. A road embankment needs volume to reach a specific elevation. A road structure needs volume to distribute stresses. A drainage layer needs volume to convey water. Dikes and dams need volume to retain water and need mass to resist water pressure, etc. The three-dimensional uh, geote geotechnical structures are typically constructed in successive layers or in adjacent zones. Between layers or zones, there is often a need for two-dimensional materials as illustrated in these uh, drawings from 1977. There is also a need for two-dimensional materials such as uh, geosynthetics to, enca to encapsulate zones of soil, which is illustrated in these uh, drawings. The contribution of two-dimensional materials can also be illustrate, illustrated with the example of waste containment landfills, an application where uh, geosynthetics are indispensable. Prevention of pollution of the environment, air, ground, groundwater requires that the waste be separated from the rest of the world. So here is an envelope separating waste from the rest of the world. The dimension of any envelope is the dimension of space minus one. In a two-dimensional space, such as this drawing, the envelope is one-dimensional. In the three-dimensional space, the real world, the envelope is two-dimensional. From all these examples, it is clear that the fact that geosynthetics are two-dimensional is a fundamental reason for their use in geotechnical engineering structures. An inherent characteristic of two-dimensional materials is the very small thickness. And the very small thickness of two-dimensional geosynthetics as beneficial consequences, for example, easy transportation of uh, two-dimensional geosynthetics, increased containment volume for liquid in a reservoir of a waste in a landfill, reduced uh, thickness of a road structure, which increases the height uh, under bridges and leaves more spaces for utilities below urban road. A beneficial consequence of the two-dimensional nature of most geosynthetics is their flexibility. Geotechnical structures are flexible and subjected to differential movements. Therefore, materials used in geotechnical structures should be flexible to avoid the development of stress concentration in the case of differential movement. Therefore, uh, geosynthetics are ideal materials for use in geotechnical structures. This photo illustrates the three properties, continuity, two-dimensionality, and flexibility. In summary, Continuity, two-dimensionality, flexibility are essential characteristics of geosynthetics that make them perfectly suited for use in geotechnical structures. But why do we need synthetic material? The reason is that there is a lack of natural two-dimensional materials which could be used in Earth's world. Natural materials are essentially three-dimensional or three-directional. Animal hides, which are the skins of large animals, are two-dimensional, and they have been used in earth construction 
and foundation of buildings in antiquity and in the Middle Ages, but they are small compared to the size of geosynthetic panels, and their geometry is not practical. Mats made of palm fronds and other plants have also been used in soil structures since antiquity, but their fabrication is labor intensive and may not be compatible with modern earthwork. An interesting example is provided by the ziggurats, which are towers constructed with clay more than 3,000 years ago in the Middle East. The most famous ziggurat is the worst one because it collapsed, the Tower of Babel. Today, geotechnical engineers know that embankments constructed uh, with uh, cohesive soils, such, such as wet clays, collapse if they reach a certain height. <clears throat> the collapse of the Tower of Babel was due to geotechnical reason <clears throat> and not to the official reason, the misunderstanding due to language difficulties of foreign workers used as scapegoats. But 3,400 years ago, some smart engineers learned from the failure. They understood that the failure of the Tower of Babel was caused by excess water in the clay. And they used layers of palm fronds to drain the clay and possibly reinforce it. The Agarkuf ziggurat in Iraq was constructed with layers of palm frond 3,400 years ago, and it is still uh, 57 meters high uh, today. Today, we would do the same with uh, geocomposites providing drainage and uh, reinforcement. It should be noted that the 3,400-year-old palm fronds are still in a good uh, condition. This remarkable durability should encourage the use of natural fibers under adequate conditions. A similar technique was used in portions of the Great Wall of China constructed 2,000 years ago. Despite these spectacular achievements thousands of years ago, it is clear that nature does not provide large two-dimensional materials which are ready to use in modern earth works. <clears throat> Therefore, two-dimensional materials must be fabricated for use in earth works. Because of the considerable development of the, of the synthetic products industry in the 20th century and the adequate properties of synthetic materials, the geosynthetics were the natural choice. Well, natural, so to speak. Various applications of uh, geosynthetics are a display of two-dimensionality. But one may argue that geoform is a successful geosynthetics, even though it is not uh, two-dimensional. Indeed, geoform is used in geotechnical applications to replace soil by providing volume with negligible mass, which is beneficial, for example, to embankments on weak soil and, and compressible soil. However, we will see that the geoform example confirms the demonstration of the fundamental justification of two-dimensional geosynthetics. Indeed, contrary to other geosynthetics, 
geofoam is not associated with soil. Instead, geofoam is used to replace soil. In other words, geofoam is used to construct a geotechnical structure without soil. As geofoam is used in blocks, it has no continuity and no flexibility, two properties that are essential for use in association with soil. But geofoam doesn't need these two uh, properties since it is not associated with soil. This discussion shows that geofoam, which is three-dimensional and therefore does not have the properties of two-dimensional materials, continuity and flexibility, can replace soil, but cannot interact with soil. Indeed, replacing soil means acting instead of soil, not interacting with soil. So the geofoam example confirms that interaction with soil requires two-dimensional materials. Geosynthetics have pervaded most branches of geotechnical engineering, not because they replace soil, but because they interact with soil. And the geofoam example confirms that the success of geosynthetics is due to their two-dimensionality. Nevertheless, a geofoam is most welcome in the geosynthetics discipline because it provides a solution to problems posed by the weight of soils, such as compressive stress and active lateral pressure. A third fundamental reason which explains the success of geosynthetics is that many of the two-dimensional geosynthetics contain one-dimensional components, such as fibers in geotextiles, ribs in geogrids, and yarns in reinforced geomembrane. Indeed, it is appropriate to make two-dimensional materials with one-dimensional components, because making fibers, ribs, or yarns is the most efficient way to use a given amount of water since, as a result of molecular orientation, the strength of a fiber, a rib, a yarn is much higher than the strength of the original polymer. In summary, building a three-dimensional mass, a soil structure, using two-dimensional components, geosynthetics, made from one-dimensional components, fibers, ribs, yarns, is an efficient way to use matter, especially if the one-dimensional components have molecular orientation. This explains the use in soil reinforcement of geogrids, geostrips, and woven geotextile. But this is also true for most other geosynthetics because one-dimensional elements, when they are present, provide dimensional stability. It should be noted that the fundamental reasons presented in the preceding slides are linked. Associating three-dimensional soil mass, two-dimensional geosynthetics, and one-dimensional components is effective if there is continuity between them. Indeed, if the two-dimensional geosynthetics get separated from the three-dimensional soil mass, and if the one-dimensional components, fibers, ribs, yards, get dispersed, the system becomes discontinuous and it collapses. Clearly, many practical and fundamental reasons provide a sound basis for the success of geosynthetics. These reasons 
make it legitimate to state that beyond the products there is a geosynthetic discipline and the existence of a discipline justifies the existence of an international society even though some members of other international societies were against the formation of the IGS. But even a successful discipline faces challenges. The first challenge results from the simplicity of use of geosynthetic. Geosynthetic being manufactured may give the impression that they are easy to specify as a result. Regulators and committees are tempted to promote prescribed uh, designs. And this problem has affected landfill design because liner systems are easy to prescribe. And for landfill designers, it is easy to design with prescribed liner system. Thus, for some engineers, designing a landfill a liner system consists in drawing a sequence of board lines and dashed lines directly copied from regulations. This can be called designing by cartoons. Designing by cartoons is less expensive than doing a real design. And it has been argued that spending money on geosynthetics design is not justified because in many projects the cost of the geosynthetics is a small fraction of the cost of the structure. But this argument is not correct. Prescribed designs may have detrimental consequences. But the designers may be selected when selection is based on price. A reduction of the overall project cost, which often results from good design, cannot be achieved with prescribed design. Site-specific analyses are not performed and the risk of failure is increased. Also, construction costs may be higher uh, because design uh, details are not adapted to the site conditions. Furthermore, excessive regulation and prescribed designs discourage innovation. The geosynthetics discipline must remain open to innovation. However, it is fair to note that prescribed designs have had a beneficial influence on the growth of the use of geomembranes in waste containment landfills. So, in conclusion, I would say that prescribed designs must be used with caution and should allow equivalent solutions. Caution is also required with the use of functions in the design of geosynthetic applications. To perform adequate design, it is essential to identify the mechanisms involved in the considered geosynthetic application. This can be illustrated with the example of a geotextile filter performing the filtration function with different mechanisms. The mechanism involved is different in each of the following four filter applications. A geotextile filter next to a gravel drain, a geotextile filter on the downstream side of a clay core in a zone dam, a geotextile filter in a bank protection system, a geotextile filter subjected to a risk of biological clogging in a waste disposal landfill. Usual filter criteria formulas can be used only in the first of those four cases and would lead to dysfunctioning and possibly failure in the other 
cases. So this example shows that different design methods should be used in different cases characterized by different mechanisms, even though the geosynthetic performs the same function. So the design engineer who focuses only on the functions performed by the geosynthetics tend to perform automatic design if the mechanism is not identified. Caution is therefore recommended with both automatic designs and prescribed design. This leads to the subject of education. Indeed, a challenge for the IGS is the education of potential users. Even though uh, geosynthetics have provided most branches of geotechnical engineering, there are still many engineers who do not use uh, geosynthetics or engineers who do not use uh, geosynthetics properly or safely. Clearly, education is needed. To properly focus education efforts, one should keep in mind that in most soil structures incorporating geosynthetics, the volume of geosynthetics is less than 1% of the volume of soil used in the structure. Therefore, the soil cannot be ignored. And it is necessary to be familiar with geotechnical engineering to properly use uh, geosynthetics. This should serve as a guide for teaching geosynthetics to students. <clears throat> the IGS, Educate the Educators program, is excellent because educated educators will better educate students who are future users of geosynthetics. Based on the above discussion, sh students should learn about geosynthetics as well as about geotechnical engineering. A course on geosynthetics should complement, not replace, a course on geotechnical engineering. We must educate, educate not only students, but also active uh, geotechnical engineers. Geotechnical engineers are known to be conservative, and they are right to be conservative because failures of geotechnical structures are very expensive and lives can be lost. But conservative engineers are often reluctant to consider innovative solutions. By the way, uh, geotechnical engineers who dislike innovative solutions should uh, dislike uh, geotechnical engineering in the first place. Indeed, uh, geotechnical engineering is a successful discipline thanks to many innovations. We should tell geotechnical engineers who are afraid of innovative solutions that a geosynthetic solution is generally a proven solution thanks to decades of experience and research. We should tell conservative geotechnical engineers that a geosynthetic solution is often the safest solution. In other words, conservativeness often dictates the selection of a geosynthetic solution. There is another benefit of education. The importance of manufacturers in our discipline has led some outsiders to be concerned with potential commercial pressures when a geotextile is to be selected. And the more educated the users, the lower the risk of commercial influence. Here is another challenge, a frequently asked question about structures incorporating geosynthetics is, what is the expected service life? The answers provided to this question are often speculative or based on research 
that is not representative of the situation in the field. There are publications that report the performance of old structures incorporating geosynthetics. This excellent effort should be intensified. Also, the monitoring of structures incorporating geosynthetics should be encouraged. Geosynthetics equipped with sensors can, at the same time, improve and monitor geotechnical structures. Durability is probably the main concern of geotechnical engineers about geosynthetics. Therefore, a massive effort should be undertaken by the geosynthetics community to provide demonstrated answers regarding the durability of geosynthetics and the service life of structures incorporating geosynthetics. <laughs> On the positive side, there are applications where the geosynthetic can be replaced if it reaches the end of its functional life before the end of the service life of the structure. This is the case of dams and other liquid containment structures that are lined with an exposed geomembrane. In these cases, the durability of the geosynthetic is not an issue. I worked on a large dam where the geomembrane is covered with 140 millimeter thick concrete slabs and where it was evaluated at the design stage that the adopted solution would be less expensive than traditional solutions, even if the geomembrane and the concrete slabs had to be replaced every 25 years. This dam has been in service for 40 years now, and this shows that even in a case where the replacement of the geosynthetic is not easy, the geosynthetic durability may not be a problem. Another challenge is linked to the preceding one. During its presence in a geotechnical structure, that is during the service life and after, <coughs> A geosynthetic should not release harmful substances into the environment and should not break down into microplastics. And this challenge must be addressed carefully, in particular because a poorly informed public may consider geosynthetics as wasted plastics. We have just reviewed four challenges that the geosynthetic discipline and the IGS must face. Prescribed designs, education, performance in the field, uh, potential pollution by degradation, etc. In fact, the geosynthetics discipline and the IGS are already working on these uh, challenges. However, there is another challenge that I think the IGS may have to face in the future. This potential challenge is linked to the success of geosynthetics and the success of the IGS. This challenge is important because it is about the scope of the discipline and the identity of the IGS. The success of geosynthetics and the success of the IGS have attracted to our discipline and to our society products that are not synthetic. For example, products made of natural fibers or products made of steel. And we may attract more. For example, the use of biological material such as enzymes and microorganisms is becoming applicable to construction with soil. And 
in the future we may even dream of intelligent organic roots and spider webs uh, which could be used for the improvement of existing soil structures. We may reach the point where the term geosynthetics become less and less representative of our expanding discipline. I realize this is a provocative a comment. But remember, the IGS started as a geotextile society, and only seven months after its formation, we had to extend its scope to geomembranes and related products. Furthermore, nine years after the formation of the IGS, we made a very bold decision. We changed the name of the society from International Geotextile Society to International Geosynthetics Society. <clears throat> and as I said, it was important to keep the acronym IGS. And therefore, the term geosynthetics could only be replaced by a geotherm able to encompass synthetic, natural, and metallic products as well as biological material. <clears throat> Again, I realize that challenging the scope of the discipline and the identity of the IGS is very provocative. However, in an ever-changing world, we must think ahead and take advantage of the attractiveness of our discipline and the reputation of the IGS to be as open as possible and welcome all geo components. We have just reviewed some challenges that the geosynthetics discipline and the IGS must face. There are also challenges of a different nature. These are challenges that affect the world in this 21st century and are successfully addressed using geosynthetics. Thus, geosynthetics already play a key role in providing solutions to address environmental challenges such as conserva conservation of water by controlling leakage from dams and reservoirs, uh, equitable water distribution by minimizing water losses from irrigation canals, prevention of ground and groundwater pollution with geomembrane line landfills, control of soil erosion and coastal protection, landslide prevention and repair, etc. Also, uh, geosynthetics provide solutions to meet challenges related to sustainable development. They reduce the use of natural resources by allowing the optimum use of recycled materials or the construction of smaller structures. They reduce the transportation of construction materials by allowing the use of local materials. They replace processed materials such as aggregate, sand, compacted clay, etc. Regarding sustainable development, do not forget that we are an engineering discipline. As I have said many times, engineering is done with numbers, not with common sense. Therefore, the geosynthetic solutions for sustainable development must be quantified using scientifically proven method. Just saving resources or recycling materials is not sufficient the carbon footprint of the entire process must be quantified. The foregoing discussion shows that the geosynthetics discipline and the IGS are well prepared to provide solutions to meet the challenges of the 21st century. Challenges related to the environment linked to climate change and challenges related to sustainable uh, development. We are 
all anxious about the challenges of the 21st century, in particular the young generations. <laughs> to young professionals, I want to say that the youth in Velix discipline will be for you an indispensable tool to meet the challenges of the 21st century with a wide variety of products and test methods, a large number of applications, and active research, a considerable body of knowledge, including design methods and case histories, a construction practice that is well mastered with quality control and quality assurance, and last but not least, a highly respected society, the IGS. In conclusion, the use of geosynthetics is here to stay because it is supported by fundamental reasons and because the geosynthetics discipline is well prepared to meet the challenges of the 21st century. At the same time, the IGS is well organized and highly respected and it is well prepared to play an essential role in the predictable success of geosynthetics. Therefore, on this 40th anniversary, a bright future can be predicted to the IGS as well as to geosynthetics and other geocomponents. Thank you.